Good morning, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us online this morning. We've certainly been missing you at the museum and we hope that uh, you've been missing all the wonderful things we have to offer, especially our planetarium. And so today we have a special event for you. We're gonna be doing a online planetarium show one of our uh, planetarium educators, Caitlin, is gonna be leading us on a journey throughout the solar system. And so we hope that you'll enjoy it today. One of the things you should know is that if you have any questions, we'll have time for questions at the end. And so if you have questions, please put them in the comment box in, on Facebook and we will be uh, adding those up and we'll have time to answer them at the end. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Caitlin and she's gonna lead us on that journey out of this world. All right, good morning, everyone. So we're going to go ahead and get started with taking a journey through our solar system. Now, we won't be able to get to all of the planets today, but we will be able to get to some. And let's go ahead and get started. So as we're looking at this, it's a little bit boring right now, right? It's just, well, our name. But if we get rid of that, we're actually floating above the Earth. And the Earth, hopefully you're all a little familiar with it, because the Earth is, well, our home. And on the Earth, we live right about here. Right about here should be Minnesota. But a view like this of Earth is one that not a lot of people get. It's people who do go into space are astronauts. Most of them are going into space on the International Space Station or ISS. We see the orbit or the path of the ISS with this purple line. It's not that far from the Earth. So, when our astronauts go into space, most of them don't get to see a view of the entire Earth, just a small portion of it at any time. But we're not going to be just at Earth today. After all, it's home and it can be a little boring to just, you know, stay at home all the time. So we're going to go further out. We're going to start by taking a look at our entire solar system, and then we'll choose where we're going to go. Now our solar system is pretty big, it has eight planets, five or six dwarf planets, a lot of asteroids, and of course the sun. And what we're looking at right now are six, maybe seven, if we can get another green line just on the edges there of those eight planets. Now today, it's pretty sunny outside. But it's not very warm and it hasn't been very warm recently. So I would like to go somewhere that's a little bit warmer. What's somewhere that you think might be a little bit warmer? Maybe a desert or maybe just down to Texas or Florida. But we could go even further than that today. What's a planet that you think might be a little bit warmer than the Earth? All right, well, we are going to head in to the planet that is the warmest one in the entire solar system. But it's not the one you think. We're heading into Venus, the second planet from the sun. It's not the closest one to the sun but it is the hottest planet in the solar system, which is a little bit weird. And we'll figure out why that is once we get around to the daytime side. As we start to move around Venus, I want you to think if this is, well, is it similar to the Earth? Does it look a lot like the Earth? Not really, right? It doesn't look a lot like the Earth. It doesn't look a lot like home. It has all of these clouds all over it. And those clouds are what's making Venus so warm. 
because clouds act like a really big blanket. And if you wrap yourself up in a really big blanket, are you gonna get colder or are you going to get a little bit warmer? Probably warmer, right? <laughs> Probably a little bit warmer in that big blanket. And if those clouds are acting like a big blanket, they're making Venus warmer than it would be. Now, that means it's trapping in heat, which is making Venus warm enough that today it's so hot, it could melt metals like lead. So a metal like lead would be a pool on the ground. That's a bit warmer than Earth gets anywhere, even in the middle of deserts. But this isn't the only view of Venus we have. So we've sent a lot of space probes to go around Venus. And those probes have been able to show us what the surface of Venus looks like underneath the clouds. So hold on tight. We're gonna make all of those clouds go away right now. And this is the surface of Venus, kind of. We don't actually know exactly what the colors are. So instead, scientists use the colors to tell us information. And here, the lighter areas are showing us areas that might be higher up, and the darker areas are showing us areas that might be lower down. We can see that Venus has this big area of lighter colors, which might be mountains, or it might be volcanoes. Venus has a lot of volcanoes on it. But we can't quite tell if any of them are erupting, because those clouds are so thick it's really hard to see through them. And let's bring back Venus's clouds. I got a little too warm here at Venus. I know I said I wanted it to be warm because it's a little chilly today, but that was, that was too warm. So let's go further out to a planet that's colder. Let's see, what's a planet that might be colder if Venus was warm? What planets could be colder? We know Earth is a little bit colder than Venus, but we live here, we know that. Maybe Mars. What about Jupiter? Do you think Jupiter could be colder than Venus? Let's go take a look. Now, as we head out to Jupiter, we're going to be seeing something that we didn't see around Venus, because around Jupiter, there are a lot of moons. And just like these green lines show us the orbit or the path of the planets, there's going to be some orange lines around Jupiter that show us the orbit or the paths of Jupiter's moons. And Jupiter has a lot of moons. At the last count, I think it had 79 moons going around it. Now, how many do we have going around Earth? Yeah, just one. Just one going around the Earth. But Jupiter here has 79. Now, as we're here at Jupiter, we should probably take a look for one of its most famous features, the Great Red Spot, a giant hurricane. You can already see some hurricanes on the surface. All of these circles, these are hurricanes, but none of them are big enough or red enough to be the great red spot. So let's watch as Jupiter spins around for us. And if you keep an eye somewhere over here, we'll be able to see the great red spot soon. Up here, we can see the shadow of one of Jupiter's moons. And right over here, we have the great red spot. Now this is a hurricane that is twice as big as the entire Earth. So one Earth would fit right in here. And that's actually pretty small compared to what it used to be. When we first saw this hurricane, 
400 years ago, it used to be four times as big as the Earth. Now, out here at Jupiter and Jupiter's moons, it really is that nice cold place we were looking for after Venus. Because on the cloud tops of Jupiter, right where we were just a moment ago, the temperature is, well, a little chilly. Something like negative oh, 500 degrees. Down on the surface, if it has a surface, we think that it would be about negative 200 degrees. That's a little colder than we get even in the middle of winter. But some of Jupiter's moons are warmer. And those moons that are warmer, the ones that we're really excited to look at and really excited to investigate, are what we call the Galilean moons of Jupiter. And there's four of them. We have Io, Ganymede, Europa, and Callisto. Now, I don't know if you'll be able to read these labels, but they'll help me know where we are. So Callisto is right here. Ganymede's a little closer in. And if we zoom in a little bit more, we'll be able to see that Europa is here and Io is here. Now, we're going to visit one of those moons. And I think a good one to visit, gosh, it's almost lunchtime. Let's go visit Io. Because, well, when we get there, Io kind of reminds me of a pizza, at least for how its surface looks. That's because Io is covered in volcanoes. It has more volcanoes than anything else in the solar system. Which is a little weird because moons generally don't have volcanoes. They should be so cold that they don't have any lava or magma. But Io does because it's so close to Jupiter that it's kept warm. As we're getting closer, you can see the colors of Io are a bit different than our moon. And you can see why I thought of Io when I thought of lunch. Because it does look a little bit like a pizza bit. Well, with all of those dark spots, maybe a, maybe a moldy pizza. Maybe not one that you'd want to eat for lunch. Now, all of those dark spots are the volcanoes on the surface of Io. And it's all of these different colors because of stuff that comes out of those volcanoes. Not just lava, but things like sulfur. All this yellow color is the color from the sulfur that comes out of volcanoes. Now it looks like we're getting pretty close to the end of my time with you today, but before we go to time for questions, I want to show you one last thing. And to do that, we are going to head away from Jupiter and Io and all of Jupiter's moons. And we'll head back to Earth, because the last thing I want to show you is something that you don't actually need a planetarium to see. You can go outside tonight and take a look at them. You won't be able to see as many as you can see here in the planetarium, but you'll still be able to see them if those clouds stay away. I want to show you the constellations with pictures in our sky. Now, there are 88 official constellations. And official just means that about a hundred years ago, a bunch of astronomers sat down and said, we're going to use these pictures to map out the sky. So things like the Big Dipper, not actually a constellation. They didn't make the cut. But the Great Bear, or Ursa Major, that the Big Dipper is a part of, did. And we're going to go ahead and turn on all of those constellations, and then back away from Earth a little bit so we have a better view of them. Now, seeing just the lines doesn't always help, but seeing pictures and even names can. So right now it's spring, and you can probably see Virgo and Leo in your night sky. And if we keep going the direction we were heading, Remember that big bear that I just told you about? 
that's Ursa Major. This really big bear with a really long tail. All right, but I think it's time now for us to go to questions so I can answer all of the questions that you guys have. Amber's been keeping an eye on that for me. So what we're going to do is I'm going to pop back on so you can see me again. And then we're just going to go back so that you can see Amber and I and we'll answer questions that you've had. Does that sound all right, Amber? All right. All right. Thank you, Caitlin. You're um, welcome. So I've been watching the comments that have been coming in, and I actually have a few questions for you myself. Um, our friend on Facebook, if you're still out there and watching and you have some questions for Caitlin, go ahead and just type them in the comment box. And by typing them in the comment box, we can see them and, and answer them here. Um, so my first question for you, Caitlin, is what exactly is a gas giant? So a gas giant, something like Jupiter, is a planet that isn't mostly rock. So Earth and Mars, those are mostly rock. It doesn't have those solids. We also don't quite know if it's got any solids to it at all. We're not sure. We haven't been able to figure that out. We do know that they're covered in a lot of gas, a lot of layers of air, which is how we get so many of those colors and clouds. All right, very cool. Um, you also were talking a lot about, um, uh, let's see here, uh, Galilean moons. Can you tell me a little bit more about what makes them special? The Galilean moons are the first four moons that were ever recorded around another planet. And I wanna give people in chat about 10 seconds to guess who might have found the Galilean moons. It shouldn't be too hard. So it was indeed Galileo who found those Galilean moons. And finding those moons, seeing them going around Jupiter over the course of a month, changed the way people thought about the universe. Because before that, we thought that everything went around the Earth. So the sun went around the Earth, and the moon went around the Earth, and Jupiter went around the Earth, and Jupiter's moons should have gone around the Earth. Seeing something going around Jupiter and a few other unexplainable things with that model meant that we had to change up how we thought of it. And it turns out there's really only one thing that goes around the Earth, and that's our moon. Everything else goes around the sun or other planets or even the center of galaxies. Wow, excellent. Um, you'll be happy to know that that someone actually guessed Galileo, so they fantastic they that right. And we do also um, have a couple of questions that came in um, from the audience. Um, the first one is from Thaddeus, who is familiar to us, um, and he wants to know why Saturn is the best planet. Well, for those of you who don't know, Thaddeus is one of our other planetary educators here at the Bell. And he thinks Saturn is the best planet because it's the prettiest and has rings and lots of moons, but he's wrong. Saturn is not the best planet. The best planet is Neptune because it has so many mysteries still surrounding it. Excellent. I, I appreciate that perspective. So it looks like we also have a question from um, a, a Clifford and Clifford is wondering um, he'd like to know how hurricanes don't damage a planet that is made of gas. Okay, so hurricanes are really just clouds that are... Now, I'm not an Earth scientist or an atmospheric scientist, but at their very basic level, hurricanes are clouds with strong winds moving in circles. And here on Earth, they're really destructive when they hit land, but they're not actually that destructive to our air. So 
because hurricanes are made up of tiny little pieces of drops of liquid and also a bunch of gas, they're just moving through the other gas. They're not destroying it. It's like if you pour, oh, if you pour orange juice into Sprite to get some fizzy orange juice. You're not completely destroying either. They're just mixing together and moving through each other. Okay, thank you. Um, so it looks like we've got another question and maybe we have time for this for this last one and it might be a complicated one, but Rose wants to know how stars are made. Oh boy, <laughs> that is a bit of a complicated one. So it goes back to gases and before stars are even stars, there's just a big cloud of gas and dust kind of floating out in space. And eventually that cloud of gas and dust starts from a ball and starts to collapse down into a disc, kind of like a CD. I don't know, do people still use CDs? I do. Now, once it starts to collapse down, that gas, the stuff inside of it, starts getting closer and closer together. And as it gets closer and closer together, at the very center, it starts getting close enough that it interacts with itself and begins creating light, making light. Now when it starts making light, that's what we call a star. So that's how a baby star will be formed. And often those clouds of gas are big enough that there's more than one star. Think of like the Eagle Nebula, the pillars of creation, those big three things sticking up. There are hundreds of stars forming inside those clouds of dust. Wow, that is amazing. Um, oh, someone knows what a CD is. So fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> but, and let's take one final question. I think we have time for it because this is one that interests me. Zelda wants to know how long it would take to get to Mars. Ooh, that is a good question, Zelda. So it takes us about nine months to get to Mars. And Amber, I think I'm going to share my screen again because that okay. can help us see what exactly this is. I know this was unplanned, but it's a great Love question. <laughs> so, oh, let's go ahead and take that card off. So to get to Mars, it takes about nine months when you're at the best time to go to Mars. Because the distance between Earth and Mars is changing all the time. And we'll see that as we head above our solar system here. So that green line with the red circle around it, that is the Earth with our moon going around us. And further out from the Earth, just one more away from here, so Earth and Mars. Now, if we make time start moving really fast, we'll be able to see that they move at different speeds around the sun. So you can see Earth is catching up to Mars and right here would be about when it would take nine months to get to Mars from the Earth. Now, if you are going to Mars, it's going to be a longer journey than nine months because it takes nine months to get there, but the Earth and Mars keep moving during those nine months. And by the time those nine months are done, you're right about here, and Mars is still way down here. So you have to wait around until the next time Earth and Mars come back together, when it'll be another nine months then to come back home. So if you wanna take a round trip to Mars and not just live there forever, it'll be about two years. But for things like our rovers that live there forever, it takes them nine months. All right, thank you. I appreciate that explanation. So I think that's about all we have time for today. I want to thank you so much, Caitlin, for bringing one of our planetarium programs online. I hope that everyone had a great time. Um, we'll be doing more things live on Facebook in, in the coming weeks um, as our building continues to be closed. Um, we hope yeah. to see you all here um, as we start to explore some of more of this online programming. So thank you again to Caitlin. Everyone give her a round of applause at home.
gosh. And we hope you all have a wonderful day and we'll see you again soon. Bye.